will be a little bit more technical. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Gautam Das, uh, I will be teaching mostly MAC protocol for short range communication, but uh, what we will try to do is we will try with something which is not completely short range. So, uh, which is we call it Wi-Fi because it, it started from there only. Okay, so, we will first try that and then afterwards we will uh, go towards the short range communication and associated problem with it. So, before going into the uh, actual Wi-Fi protocol. Today probably we will be discussing about that and the associated problems with it. I will start with the genesis. So, what do I mean by genesis? It is like this, why exactly Mac is required? Why anybody should design a Mac? What are the consideration? What are the things that should be considered while designing a Mac? So, this is something I will start with. Okay. So, the first basic what do we mean by media access control? It is like I have a shared media and everybody is hungry, they have data to transmit. Okay. Now, they want to transmit the data either coordinated or uncoordinated. So, already I, I have spoken about two terms coordinated uncoordinated. We all are aware of coordination because in media access there is a term called multiplexing which comes inherently. Okay. So, if I coordinate probably multiplexing can be done easily because all the users has somebody to listen to whatever he arbitrates he acts accordingly. The simplest media access or I should say multiplexing we know is TDM multiplexing. What used to be done in any TDM, so any access network you take the first kind of access network was always with TDM multiplexing. So, I have a voice so, everybody has. I go to the switching center, my voice is encoded with 64 kbps and then what we do? We give slots for each encoded voice, okay, PCM encoded voice, we give slots and as many we want to multiplex within that 125 microsecond because I know that after 125 microsecond again another sample of voice comes. Okay. Within that as many I want to multiplex, I will multiply that is very good, it is called TDM multiplexing. I, I might have 24 channels, I might have 30 channels, I can just multiplex within this 125 microsecond. Everyone has their precise location in the time axis. So, if I can put the time, everyone this is user 1, this will be user 2 and so on. That is their address. So, within the time as long as it is synchronized and I can identify the frame uh, properly, I know exactly whose data is this and the second one whose data is that. Okay. So, there is no access control here, it is probably the simplest one. Very good, this was probably sufficient, but now let us try to see what happens with this. I will talk about a concept called statistical multiplexing, how many of you already know about it? Many of you might be knowing, many of you might not be. So, I assume okay, we want to do multiplexing. So, what do I mean by multiplexing? I have suppose this is the time t I am considering. I have two chunks of data from some user let us say 1 and 2. Okay. At the same time I have another input, I want to multiplex these two data. So, again within that t time I have two chunks of data, let us call it 3 and 4. So, this is how it is coming. 
in TDM multiplexing, what was happening? Continuous streams of data were coming. When I want, when I wanted to multiplex it, what do I mean by multiplexing? I'll be putting it into the same output link because I want to multiplex them. So same output link, but see within T, there's no buffer in it. I cannot keep something waiting over here. So within T, all this data has to be put in, right? That's what I want. So if that is the case, so within T, I have to put this four data. Now what will happen? I'll put the one over here, followed by three, followed by two and four. So I'm interleaving and multiplexing. So I take one of this one, put it first, then the next, then this round robin fashion. I keep doing it. What has happened eventually? I had to put actually here, I'm transferring within the T time double data. So my data rate becomes twice. Very nice, there was no problem in it. Let's add another one, same thing will be happening, right? So this has to be now subdivided into six slots and I'll be putting one after another, no problem in this. The problem comes when I don't have continuous streams of data. Where exactly I can see that kind of data? Voice, no. That too, these days voice, yes, it is still bursty. Because earlier what we used to do, any voice, we are just sampling it. Some of the moments, there was nothing, we were not talking. But that silence period also, we were actually sampling and we were encoding it. What does that mean? We are encoding noise, it is not required. So I can actually compress voice by doing that. Whenever the talks part is there, I will actually encode it. Whenever nothing is there, I will not encode. So what, what will eventually happen? There will be occasional voids created. Now the problem arises. I have here, if I want to multiplex these three trim, streams, I need to have six slots. So overall data rate is three times. Now see how much data is coming. It is only four data. I could have allocated them by making it two times. I am not able to do that because I am doing time division multiplexing. That hinders me. Even if I have void, I have no option to skip that. I still have to reserve a particular slot for it and I still have to transmit it even though nothing is there. If I have data or video which are predominantly it's determined by human behavior, which generally takes on off. So something, whatever, whenever we do, we are like means any other machine, right? We can work for some times, we have to pause for some time. So it is always like that. All data by any human behavior is being generated are always bursty. That's fundamental nature of data. If that is true, even voice was like that, we were wrongly encoding it. We were sampling it everywhere. So that is why we were generating continuous streams of data that will never be generated. If that is never been generated, I am wasting my bandwidth over here. I could have done some other multiplexing. This is the genesis of packet switching. This statistical, the multiplexing I could do is something like this. I will take one, two, I will arbitrarily choose five, four, I will arbitrarily choose four and I will put it over here. But then there is a problem. The problem is, earlier I was nicely having the address. A time slot was telling me exactly where from the data is coming. Now I don't have that. So what do I do for that? I add redundancy to the packet. So I add a header which identifies whose data is this and where it should go. Immediately, I don't have to actually specifically put it in time slot. So that problem is gone. Just by adding a little bit of header, I can do this. So packet switching is basically the enabler of statistical multiplexing, which is required because I want to over provision my network or I should say under provision my network. That means whenever network is getting aggregated, I know that it is not the aggregated rate that I have to put at the egress point. I can always put little bit lesser. I know that data is bursty, 
So, I can always take the advantage of statistical multiplexing over there. Okay. So, this is what is happening. So, if you just see whatever I have written, the circuit switching versus packet switching and then statistical multiplexing, packet switching is the enabler of that. You will see or will appreciate that why this beginning is required, we will we'll come to that. Okay. Now, let us try to see something else because I want to go to media access control. So, for that let me try to see what is the difference between when we do routing and when we do media access. A simple example, I have a switch over here, the ethernet switch we know, okay. two input ports looking towards another output port heading towards that. Or I have a hub over here. If sufficient amount of power level is coming, I know that some transmission is going on in the channel. So, I can always detect transmission in the channel when I am not transmitting. So, if I can employ that, then at least I can avoid when somebody else is transmitting. I should not corrupt his transmission. Same will be reciprocated to me also. I expect that if everybody is rationally behaving, they are after all machines. So, whichever way they are encoded, they will be behaving accordingly. So, if I am behaving rationally, they will also behave rationally. I know that there will be little bit of less chance of collision, but is that good already? Probably not. Let us see why not. Again, I will go back to that ethernet hub example. I have suppose four users connected to this ethernet hub. So, they have a ingress port and coming back which they listen to. right? So, whichever packet I transmit, it goes all the way through the hub and then hub actually broadcast it to every other port including his own port. So, the same packet comes back to him. Okay. Now, I st start transmitting the packet. Fortunately or unfortunately, I cannot make the velocity of light infinity thanks to Einstein. Okay. So, if that is the case, then probably this packet immediately will not be transmitted to this guy there is a propagation delay. However, small it is there is a finite time of propagation delay. So, I transmit this packet there will be a delayed transmission to him that particular time period. So, this is where if I see the global clock, clock this is where he started transmitting and this is where he will get the packet he will be listening the packet. And this is actually the propagation delay of this link. If that is the case, see he started transmitting from here, I receive it from here. So, in between this period is called vulnerable period, I can still transmit within this period. There is a possibility of transmitting within this period. And if I transmit, then even though I am employing the carrier sensing, I am still not able to actually avoid collision. Of course, if I start transmitting over here or over here, I will be able to detect the collision or I should not say detect collision, I will be able to see something is happening in the media, I should abort transmission. But if my packets comes over here, which is a finite probability, I will be still colliding. Okay. And once I collide, what happens? There will be a collided transmission, it will end, both the nodes have packets, they will again jump into it. So, they will infinitely collide. Now, you can see even with CSMA, I achieve nothing. I actually create potential enemy who knows nothing about it. They just come to the channel, collide, end transmission, again come to the channel, collide. They keep doing that. So, I achieve nothing by that. Throughput will be almost 0. Okay. Or I should not say 0, aloha wise, whatever throughput you have got probably you will get the same thing, you will not get anything, any benefit from this. So, I have to employ something, what do I do? First thing is the collision detection. See what happens here, generally these length are almost taken to be similar. Okay. Once that is happening, I transmit something, it comes back to me with some power. Somebody else transmit that also comes through this entire path and comes to me. If I now do a again power integration, I know exactly 
when one packet is being transmitted and when more than one packet is being transmitted. I can distinguish between these two, because there will be a distinguished disting, distinguishable labels difference. I can always put a threshold and say whether it is a single transmission or it is a collided transmission. So, I can actually detect collision through this mechanism. So, after the transmission has been started, if I keep transmitting for some amount of time and if the other guy also is transmitting, everybody can detect collision. Once I detect collision, what should I do? Because I have detected collision, I should immediately about transmission. So, that is exactly what I will be doing. I transmit for some amount of time, I do not actually, it is anyway waste. It is already a collided data, why should I keep transmitting that? I about transmission, that is the first thing. Second thing is, after doing that, we will be employing something called collision avoidance or collision resolution. Okay. So, after doing collision detection, we will be avoiding collision, how we do that in a distributed manner. So, that is the challenge, because in a centralized manner, you can always do that. But in a distributed manner, I exactly do not know how many are colliding, who is trying to attempt and all those things, whether he will be attempting again or not, how do I stop him, who will actually attempt and who will not attempt, how do I coordinate all these things. Instead of coordinating that, what we can do is, immediately after seeing the collision, I know that potentially more than one users are there. So, what I do, just after the collision detection has happened and I have aborted transmission, I do not immediately jump to the channel to transmit my data. I have data, the other guy, so the other guy has. So, what we do, we actually put some slots. Okay. Let us take four slots and then within this four, we pick a random number with some uniform distribution. What is the possibility that both of them will be choosing the same number? Very less and this possibility goes down as I increase the slot size, number of slot. If it is 8, it will be 1 by 8 into 1 by 8, that is the probability of having a collision or little bit modified version of that, but this is going to be the collision probability. So, as I increase this slot, you can already appreciate that collision probability will be, I should not say collision, that they will start from the same slot will be increased. Now, how do I choose this slot size in time, carefully chosen, so that this time is bigger than the biggest propagation delay of the channel. Very carefully note this, that is very important for designing, that this slot size is always bigger than the overall propagation delay of the complete network. Why I am doing that? Because what I will mandate is somebody has chosen two. So, he has chosen 2, the other guy has chosen 3 suppose. So, he will start from here, the other guy will start from here, but because he is starting from here, if this is already bigger than the propagation delay, this communication will reach to him and I immediately from my carrier sensing will identify that there is something going on in the channel all about transmission. That is very nice, I have resolved the collision now. Okay. So, this is how collision resolution and collision avoidance was taking place. Very good up to this. Now, we will come to our actual problem. We have wireless, that is again similar thing, one media, everybody wants to access this, packet radio or something like that. Everybody wants to access that. Can I do the same thing? Why not? It is that MAC protocol was proposed for wireline or Ethernet, why can't we do the same thing? This looks like a very reasonable thing. Let us see what happens. In wireless, what I want to do? I want to employ few things. One is carrier sensing, that has to be done. Collision detection, that also has to be done. And then collision avoidance. These are the three steps we have discussed precisely. So, carrier sensing, can I do? I am not transmitting, I get something from the network good, no problem in that, I can do that. Because something will be coming, if that is above noise level, that is meaningful signal. So, of course, I will detect that something is there in the channel. Carrier sensing, there is no problem. Let us talk about now collision detection. What do I mean by collision detection? Suppose I am transmitting, I have to detect collision, then only I can avoid transmission. I am transmitting, somebody else is transmitting. I want to now see, like the Ethernet case, that there is a distinct difference in power level. 
if one transmission was going on after integrating this is the power I get, if two or more transmission is going on it will be at least bigger than two times or more. Okay. And then I can put a threshold if it is bigger then it is collision, if lesser no collision. This is what we have employed, now in wireless the problem is I transmit I receive at the same location, my receiver is completely saturated by the power of my transmission. Look at the other guy who is transmitting, he is transmitting at a distance and he is covering the whole distance. So, basically his power will be attenuated, once it comes to me it is almost noise to me. Can I now get a very distinct collision detection threshold, I would not be able to get, because what will happen even if I integrate that power, this is my power which is completely saturated by my transmission, on top of that there will be very less and on top of this there is noise, I would not be able to detect whether there is a collision or not. So, collision detection is thrown out of window, it cannot be done in wireless. So, already I can see this is why I wanted to take you through this journey, because you will be able to appreciate that you go to a different domain, different problem set comes, different kind of requirement for Mac comes, that is where Mac is so important. Okay. You will be have, having, we will see more examples of such things that you will be having different sets of problem and different kind of handling you will have to employ over here. That was one problem, okay. so maybe if I just go to this WLAN, this particular point we have discussed, collision detection that is a problem. I have listed if you see some more problems, what are those problems, let us try to understand the first problem clear demarcation of collision domain, that is very important aspect, let us try to understand this part. Suppose we have a ethernet network, ethernet hub like this, I put another hub, so this is suppose ECE department and computer science department, I put another sets of users connected to this hub, somehow they are not connected. If even if it is connected, connected through a bridge which isolates the transmission. Okay. If this is the case, the collision domain is completely separated. Collision domain for this guy and this guy is no way overlapped, because both of them can simultaneously transmit without having any collision because I have two separate network physically separated, the electromagnetic wave is no way coming in contact with each other, very well demarcated collision domain, more hubs will put, we will have more domains. Fortunately that is or unfortunately that is something I cannot create in air, can I put comp compartment or partitioning that okay, this is the domain of collision for these users and somehow tell my electromagnetic wave that you should not travel to that other room, I cannot do that. You will see probably when we come to actual short range 60 gigahertz probably that is true, we will come to that later on, the things changes as you change your definition of networking. But here at least at 2.4 gigahertz or even lower frequency you have no such things, it will penetrate, it will go to the other room whatever separation you put it will still be penetrated. Okay. So, the domain is no longer separated, that is a big problem, because I cannot even define who are my domain, in my domain, I cannot even define where I can actually reuse the same collision domain, I cannot do that. Okay. So, that is another problem and due to that there will be a concept which you will be listening quite of often which is called special reuse. What do I mean by special reuse? It is like this, a particular frequency and time I am using over here, same frequency and time another user can use without actually colliding. That means, they are enough specially separated, so that they do not create interference to each other. Okay. As long as that is happening, I can actually simultaneously transmit. I have a different collision domain, but to identify that properly that is very difficult, we will come back to that problem also, how wireless has solved that, very nice proposal you will see a very simple thing solves it very nicely. 
then there are other things we will little bit talk about this interference problem again almost related to this collision domain if I transmit simultaneously they will create interference with interference how do, how do I create meaningful transmission that is another challenge of wireless communication and of course this is something we know wireless channel is bad it has multipath propagation Doppler shift lots of other problems small scale fading large scale fading all kinds of things and due to that we have a erroneous channel which is also time varying so I have problem ok. So, these are four problems, but is it all problematic then why should I invest in wireless communication I should not be talking about wireless communication if it is all problematic there are some advantages which are listed here of course mobility that is what we want we do not want to be confined while doing my networking and very importantly I can almost especially in the short range communication I can almost make it ad hoc once I make it ad hoc I have no single point of failure I cannot suppose even Wi Fi I can make the Wi Fi access point failed immediately the entire network goes down same thing happens with wired network I put suppose from IIT whatever from the gateway of IIT whatever connectivity is going on I cut that entire IIT network will be down that is called single point of failure and whenever you are designing a big network you need to keep that in mind can I make my network infrastructure in designed in a such a way that some failure here and there does not affect the whole network that is something which is and we these days we are hearing lot about disaster resilient network the network we provide whenever there is a big disaster can we still have network so that some data meaningful data however low data rate that is is still carried out ok. So, that is something which are the advantage of this wireless communication. So, that is why we will invest in it ok. Now, let us try to see whatever problems we have talked about what was the philosophy behind wireless Mac to solve this. It is already time no I still have 20 minutes to ok. So, the first thing is by using this RTS CTS let me try to understand this first. So, what we are trying to do suppose I have a transmitter over here I have a receiver over here I want to transmit to this guy ok no problem in that I can always transmit that only problem is there might be potential competitor who will collide with my data ok. So, I, I need to stop that how do I stop that if I start transmitting carrier sensing will actually give me some advantage whenever I am transmitting suppose with R radius he can be heard ok that means up to R he has meaningful signal beyond that it is very low beyond means lower than noise level. So, that cannot be detected that is no interference. So, up to this area he is actually creating meaningful interference ok. If that is the case if he start transmitting and fortunately the other transmitter tries to transmit little late his carrier sensing will tell that do not transmit over here no problem in that. But think about this this is a receiver I have a potential transmitter over here beyond the domain of the transmitter ok. Can he hear his transmission no way he cannot because it is restricted by that domain. So, he is not able to hear his transmission what will happen if he has a data he can start transmitting once he transmit it will again create another domain where he will be actually heard right. Now, where the collision will be happening it is about the receiver because they, there I want to receive the signal transmitter I do not care transmitter I already know the information that is zero information to me I, I know everything I do not have to again re know that. So, it is the receiver who is potentially getting this signal, but for him 
this guy will create huge interference. But you can see my carrier sensing is failing over here clearly. Only carrier sensing will work over here, but who restricted the user over here? We are talking about that clear demarcation of collision domain, you can see it already. The collision domain non existent. I have a collision domain over here when he is transmitting, but there is potential collider beyond that range where carrier sensing does not work. I have a big problem. This problem is called hidden node problem. Means for the transmitter to the receiver, this transmitter is hidden. I cannot that receiver means while transmitting I cannot detect his presence or he cannot detect my presence. So, he can always over the entire period of data transmission he can always collide with me. Potentially what should I do? I have no way to actually take it out because whatever I do I will never be able to take this out. So, what I do is I will live with it all engineers like us we have understood that some problems we have to live with. So, we will live with that problem, we will do something else very intelligently. What we what people have employed is something like this. While transmitting suppose I have 10,000 bytes of data, I keep transmitting at the end that gets collided entire because I cannot even do collision detection remember. So, this data will keep on transmitted and the entire channel will be blocked for that 10,000 bytes should I invest in that foolish plan? I should not. So, what should I do is I know there will be collision, but let us make the packet small. Let us probe the channel first. So, what I do I call it a request to send. So, while first transmitting I do not transmit my data directly, I do not commit to that. I commit a very smaller control packet. Even if it is collided not much wastage in the channel will be happening, but if it is successful and also you can also appreciate that bigger the data higher chance of collision, smaller the data smaller chance of collision. Okay. So, basically I make a small packet transmit it, if nobody transmits over here potentially what will happen? Suppose he gets the request to send. Now, I say he has now some duty to actually block this user. See whoever will be colliding him that should be in his domain. So, if he trans transmits something then probably that transmission will block everybody. So, I say whenever you receive your RTS another small packet which is the acknowledgement of RTS which is called clear to send or CTS. So, the transmission of RTS goes from transmitter to receiver and after listening to that receiver gives CTS clear to send. Once I give the clear to send that covers this entire domain everybody will be hearing that right in this domain. Now, if I do not see RTS, but I see CTS I will do the same thing, I will abort transmission because I know the channel has been captured by somebody. I cannot transmit now. Okay. So, by this small two packets I have captured the channel. How I will be capturing it? It is like this within that RTS there will be a field which says how much time I want this channel. So, through RTS I will be telling okay, next 10,000 byte is mine. If RTS is clear, nobody collides with it. Then there will be a CTS who will repeat that same thing. 10,000 byte is reserved for this transmission. So, please in my vicinity nobody should transmit. If that happens this entire vicinity is blocked. I defined my collision domain. Once I define this nobody can collide with me over that transmission. This is the beauty of that RTS and CTS simultaneous transmission of that. You might be saying okay, that is very good we have almost solved the hidden node problem, but that gives me another problem. Let us try to explore that. Suppose I have a transmitter over here. Okay. He can transmit to this receiver. Is there any problem in this transmission? 
if heat transmits okay suppose this is beyond that so if i draw the circle the receiver is beyond that so basically his transmission will never create anything to this receiver any sensation to this receiver so that means he can potentially transmit his receiver this transmitter whatever circle i have drawn that's this receiver is beyond that so these two transmission potentially create no collision right i can see that already because of the domain it does not create any collision but what is happening i have transmitter rts once this guys have listened to this rts this transmitter was also included in it he has about a transmission and when i have transmitted cts all these guys were about a transmission so potentially i had some tra transmitter who are capable of transmitting within the same time i'm actually taking them out exposing these nodes and actually telling them not to transmit that's very bad again because in wireless channel already the channel is clear my resource is clear so i want to actually exploit it as much the special reuse of this channel as much i can do but i am unable to do that i'm failing in that matter right this is appreciated well appreciated now let's see if i can just bend the rule little bit can i solve this problem this exposed node will still be able to communicate so what we say is something like this if there is a rts and after the rts immediately the cts has to come if i don't see the cts after rts i am still potential candidate to transmit if i just bend the rule little bit i don't say that both rt means either rts or cts if i see i don't transmit that was my earlier comment so this guys if i just put it suppose so i take the worst case scenario this is the transmitter this is the receiver so this, this one is just exactly r okay if i just put this way so what is happening these are the guys who are located over here they will only listen to cts these are the guys will be listening to both rts and cts because rts goes it covers this area cts goes it covers this area so this is the common area so this area both rts plus cts and this is the area where only rts will be coming so if i just say that if either of rts or cts i have seen i should about transmission then this whole area will be gone but i have seen that these are the potential hidden nodes whom i should stop so that's good i should not make them transmit of course this will create problem if the transmitter is over here he will always create problem to the to the receiver but i've seen this area which are the exposed nodes they can be potential transmitter so what i am now saying is you can see rts but if you don't see cts these are the guys who have seen rts but have not seen cts they are still potential transmitter so they can still initiate transmission good he can initiate transmission but suppose he initiate transmission to a receiver over here should he do that transmission no because this transmitter if the receiver is over here he is in the zone of this transmitter he will be having problem how that will be blocked look at this receiver what he has listened he has actually got the rts and cts so once he has seen that if he is now issuing another rts will he respond to that no and without cts no transmitter will ever transmit so basically i also take that out if this receiver was somewhere here he has not seen anything so if rts goes he will respond back with cts that transmission will go on see how nicely just by these two packets people have defined very clear collision domain with hidden node and exposed node both <coughs> is this clear to everybody anybody has any question regarding this okay. should i proceed
So, now let us try to see we have solved this hidden node problem, we have solved this exposed node problem, clearly defined the collision domain for each users very nicely they are communicating. Next the channel feedback, why we are doing that? It is like this everything you transmit for RTS we have already seen there is a feedback CTS, but for every data also we will see that there is a transmission certain transmission going on after every data which is called the acknowledgement. Why we are doing it? Because wireless channel is not reliable. So, if I transmit I have no idea whether that was correctly transmitted or not because I am investing in it I am transmitting and blocking my channel so I should know whether that transmission was correct or not. So, every data will be having its own CRC check some bits with that the recipient will be able to see whether it was correctly received if that he will be generating one acknowledgement. So, every data should be followed by acknowledgement just to make the transmission channel reliable. Okay. So, that is another thing and this carrier sensing we have talked about what they have employed there are two carrier sensing if you see physical carrier sensing I can do if I am not transmitting I can always uh, integrate that uh, signal and try to see whether something is there, but there is also a virtual carrier sensing which is whenever I transmit RTS CTS I say also how much time I block the channel. So, that says all others that this many amount of time carrier is blocked. So, that is a indirect or virtual carrier sensing for all others just with a field we are specifying that. Okay. So, there are other things we will be coming to fragmentation data fragmentation then you will see with data also that comes because it is in the header. So, you have the provision of giving that anywhere you can give that. Okay. So, I think we have enough background now to appreciate why and how that MAC has been designed. It if you ask me initially it was probably a daunting task, but you can see multiple things has been resolved by this simple mechanism many things has been very nicely resolved okay. and once we go through it you will probably appreciate it even more because once we go to the details of the protocol then you will see these things how they are being managed. Okay. So, these are just informative uh, as long as you have got this philosophy I would not care about these things. Okay. So, you have types of frames that is being transmitted between transmitter and receiver you have that RTS CTS act we have already discussed about that and you have this other two things which will come to later. In this particular network it can either act in ad hoc mode or it can also act in supervised mode. So, for the supervised mode that is what those are the packets we will be using we will come back to that later on. There are few management frames just to means associate one user to the network initially at the beginning then authenticate him and all those things. Beacon is something which will be for synchronization reason will be required we will also see that and of course, the data frame. So, yes I will not go into the details of it, but the basic things I will explain over here. So, we have a every frame is having this thing. So, you have the data if it is there, if it is RTS CTS you do not have any data. Okay. If it is uh, that is why I have said 0 to 2 3 1 2. So, it can be full data or it might be 0 if I am transmitting control packet other fields has to be there. So, you have frame control which is I will come back to that later. You have the duration ID which is that nav or network activation vector with which we do that virtual carrier sensing basically here we specify how much time we want to reserve the channel. Whenever you send RTS you specify the time seeing your packet size you can actually tell because you, you will be knowing all the network parameter you will be able to tell that if this much packet has to be transmitted how much time is required you will be also when we will be giving the timing diagram you will be able to appreciate that also. Okay. So, this is where you give that duration just to do virtual carrier sensing. Then there are four address but we will not go into the details of four address mostly two address is required. If you just see one is the host 
of course anything has to any networking has to have a host id where from it is originated and a destination id so those two are there rest of the things are required for all other purposes okay so sometimes you might uh, wish your data to go through the access point outside so for that sometimes for ad hoc mode you require some more uh, addresses so for that those are reserved we won't be discussing about that right now okay so these two addresses are the most important thing then there is a sequence number of each packet why that sequence number is important sometimes what might happen every packet i want a acknowledgement sometimes due to erroneous station receiver he might give other ac okay some previously stored ac he just means uh, unfortunately has sent that then what i'll be thinking that my this data also has gone through correctly but that's not the case so that is why the sequence controller has to be there where it exactly takes the sequence of the packet for which this ac is forwarded or ac is generated so that i can correspond that okay with whether this data was transmitted correctly or not okay then i have the payload and crc for error checking okay then in the frame control if you see sorry data and crc then in the frame control i'll come to that the next one yes so in that frame control we have this things one is the protocol version which says which version of because there were too many of this wifi standard right 802.11a b g n so many versions are there so basically for that version you have to reserve something so that i can identify which protocol it is and accordingly i act on it then the type which specifies which packet it is is it rts cts or ac or data which packet it is sub type to further classify we won't go into the details of that okay and this actually says if there is access point if it is coming from the access point or going to the access point just to specify it's not device to device communication it is actually going to the access point okay this more frag will come back to that when we discuss about fragmentation this helps in fragmentation okay there is some power management retry is if i was i have transmitted my data erroneously then again i have to retransmit it so i specify that okay and these are for security reason and some reserved bits okay so with this background okay so i think we have i'll just take 2 minutes so with this background we'll just talk about what are the services that 802.11 can give so it has two predominant service one is called distributed coordination function and the other one is this one point coordination function okay in distributed coordination it's actually little bit ad hoc mode they are not controlled by somebody or arbitrated by somebody it is a distributed thing anybody can wish to transmit he can transmit he can collide with others he can resolve the collision and transmit whereas in point coordination the access point will be arbitrating who will transmit when so it is almost contention free region no contention is happening because it is dependent on some master who is deciding who will transmit when so times are all pre decided okay so and we can have this three techniques one is this dcf distributed coordination function with csma ca we don't put rts cts okay so there is that means directly i put my data without bothering about rts cts then i can have dcf with rts cts and then we can have pcf so these are the three types of transmission that can go on we'll later discuss tomorrow regarding all of them how this can be done and then we'll probably from there we'll go to the ad hoc transmission mode manet little bit discussion on manet and then we'll come back to 802.11 ad which is the short range communication at 60 gigahertz okay if you have any question you can just let me know